My name's Leon Ashby. I've been a property owner out in Western Queensland uh, for a decade out at Aramac. Fraser and I were uh, going around Queensland a few weeks ago. We went to nine different uh, towns or places and talked with landholders and people who are interested about um, this idea. The uh, way we currently manage water is that we let most of it run out to sea. Um, so when we have a flood, you get a lot more water in a flood than in your smaller flows and it's your floods that we should be controlling. We should be trying to keep the flood waters as high up in the, um, in the elevation in dams and in places for storage and then let it run down to the lower areas so it's all gravitational. So that just gives you an idea of the plume which is the water that runs out to sea uh, from the Burdekin River. There's the Burdekin Dam when it's in flood and uh, less than 5% of the water uh, in that catchment store to use along the coast in that and other um, dams. And there's only about 2,000 gigalitres in that dam. And what we're going to talk about tonight is more than 30,000 gigalitres, okay? So it's, it's a fair bit of water. And of course, we don't uh, store it for sustained droughts that are in the inland and being able to use it. But that's what we're going to try and do with this plan. So the idea is that flood waters will be diverted uh, from the high elevations into the inland. There'll be over 600 kilometres of diversion channels in what I'm talking about tonight. There'll be large inland dam storages. There'll be diversion channels that are also used as storages. Now that's something different. That's the big issue that we'll talk about a bit. One, water allocation's been given with a two year drought in mind. So, because a lot of the times we don't just have one year, sometimes we have two or three year droughts. I've been in them, Fraser's been on his property when he was growing up, had a 14 year drought. So uh, I was on a uh, property that had uh, a three-year drought a couple of times. So, but if you have an allocation for two years, you'd uh, be able to withstand that a lot better. Um, how much water are we talking about? Well, for those of you who saw that map, which is a satellite map a few months ago, that's the Flinders River and Saxby River in flood. And there was uh, 20,000 square kilometres, so 300 k's by 70 k's wide, covered in a sheet of water. Now, if you said that that was one, one and a half metres deep across that, might have been more, I don't know, but that's in excess of 30,000 gigalitres, went out to sea in just 10 days. To give that some context, that's three times the amount of water that is used to irrigate the Murray-Darling Basin, okay? Then there's two dams that could have stored that, uh, half that flood and minimised the deaths of 400,000 cattle that occurred. So those little spots there are where there's good d dam sites, one for 10,000, gigalitres and the other one for 5,000 gigalitres. Part of this is the Macross and Burdekin Bridge and uh, it's 13 metres high but you can see on the left they're the markers of how high the water has been in some floods above the bridge. So there's massive amounts of water when we have, when we have floods and that's the water we should be catching. In North Queensland we have 200,000 gigalitres of water goes out to sea each year so that's 20 times the amount that is used in the uh, Murray-Darling Basin for irrigation. And it's 400 Sydney harbours of water or 80 million Olympic swimming pools of water. You can't imagine those sorts of numbers. But that's just how much it is. So we have 20 times the amount of the Murray-Darling goes out to sea each year. And that, what the Murray-Darling produces is $22 billion worth of produce each year. So they're probably big numbers, but um, it shows you what the potential could be if we could have some of that water utilised. So here's a map, shows you the rainfall areas, where the most of the rainfall is, and we're talking about water coming from that area into uh, a couple of areas south of it, a couple of different systems to bring it down and irrigate inland. Uh, here's a quick overview. Now the orange and the yellow areas are two different systems. The orange area is what's been typically called the Bradfield scheme. That's water from the Tully, Herbert and Burdekin rivers then going down inland and uh, the other one the yellow one is what's uh, I'm calling it the uh, the Inersley system which brings water from four big rivers and that brings it right down to Richmond so those they're the catchment areas those two colors and then uh, you bring it down inland for the areas in green so that that's just a bit of a quick overview and roughly how much it would uh, cost and how much it would benefit from uh, bringing those systems into being so what makes this plan so different? Well, I've done a bit of a model and it's just down the front. The idea is being able to capture the floods. 
And to do that, we have a pipeline or a diversion or an aqueduct, you call it what you like, uh, that would be 15 metres by 15 metres wide, 15 high and 15 wide. Now, this is a new, those who saw the previous presentations when we're going around, this is a, an improvement on what we were talking about with the, uh, the pipeline. This is open at the top. We don't need the concrete at the top. We can now make these. Uh, I just checked out, did some research on how water moves, and we can move water along the contour. We can have those diversion channels, aqueducts being anywhere from 50 kilometres to 150 kilometres long, storing 15 metres of water all the way along. That will give us the capacity of moving 500 gigalitres of water a day. Now, uh, that's big numbers, but uh, uh, that's a lot of water, and that's the type of numbers that we need if we're going to move that, those floodwaters inland. So it's entirely gravitational. We've got some efficiencies here where we can improve on using pipes and the, the catchment area for capturing floods with this system doubles. So the area that I've got in the purple area is an area of catchment that you wouldn't get by just running it into dams. And the red circle area is also an area that would capture water with that uh, pipeline aqueduct system. And you get an extra 1,000 gigalitres of storage for every 150 kilometres of aqueduct. So what are the bonuses for the system? The aqueducts have flexibility in length and position. You can move around town, uh, put the aqueducts in different positions so the water goes around the town. Uh, you have concrete uh, will not get eroded or worn down, so it's going to last for a thousand years or something like that, as long as concrete and steel last. Uh, and it can be paid for, like the Snowy Hydro Scheme and uh, the two world wars, they were paid for by a development bank that creates credit, that builds the asset, but it doesn't have to pay off the credit created because the nation owns the asset and benefits from it. So it's not like um, you do with a business loan. So what environmental benefits are there? There's less runoff of nutrients into the Great Barrier Reef. There's less stock and native animal deaths as a result of droughts and as a result of floods. Uh, there's greater soil fertility and soil organisms uh, in the irrigated area, so we're actually building up the biomass. And there's greater volumes of water for fish species to live in. So they're just some of the environmental benefits. Keeping fish species separate between the catchments is probably one of the challenges, but that can be done with, with filters uh, which are uh, fine gravel and you let the water flow through it and that stops the fish going from one catchment to another if you want to stop them from doing that. Uh, and you can, of course, containing feral animals and plagues because of the greater abundance of food and water might be a challenge as well. But how far south can we take the water? Well, from the area that uh, you catch it, you can go down through the, into the Thompson, Baku and Diamantina catchments, the, the dam between Blackwall and Isisford and that's where this little dot is, that blue dot. And that's probably as far south as you can go gravitationally, but from there it can be pumped up uh, about 100 metres uh, for about 50 k's and go into the Murray-Darling system if you really believed you had to take water into the Murray-Darling. How many stages can the system be built in and how quickly can each stage be built? Well, uh, you can build the aqueducts first, they can then build the irrigation delivery system to the farms Second, then you build the larger storages and you conclude with building your tunnels and your hydroelectricity systems. And uh, the aqueducts can be built, uh, 300 k's of aqueduct could be built in a year if you had different teams, like say 30 teams, and they all had to build 10 k's each and then they all join up. So the system could be brought into play very quickly. And here's a map which we'll have a look at later and uh, it's just a diagram of where the water would go, which would be where those green lines are. Coming down from north of Charters Towers at Hell's Gate is one system. This is just the Bradfield one. And uh, the water uh, gravitationally goes down to Lake Webb, into the edges of uh, Lake Buchanan, and uh, uh, down Lake Galilee. And this is a, the contour map design, which is the same uh, area. And it just shows you the elevations. And it has on there the, um, the ponds, roughly where they would be, or what you call the ponds or the small lakes or the catchment storages with the, uh, the aqueducts and where some of the inland uh, storages could be. And uh, Hell's Gate Dam would store water uh, up the top on, you can sort of see a bit of a water area that's got a, um, a floodgate and a, a cutting in it. That's where the cutting is. And that's where you'd run the water out and into the uh, contours and the ponds 
of all the mini lakes that are made and way down into the inland. And there's uh, four different uh, areas that have got, uh, say, saddles. They're the lowest areas in, in between some hills. That's where we'd be running the water gravitationally. You'd work that out where they are and be able to organise your contours and uh, aqueducts so that the water would get through those so you didn't have to do tunnels in hardly any places at all. How about expanding the existing Vertican Dam? That's possible. Uh, there it is. And you can put an extra 14 and a half to 15 metres of floodgates on top of that and you could uh, get extra volume stored and you uh, then be able to irrigate more areas via gravity. And you could also put it running out into the west from where it is and it would double as a drought pipeline for irrigation. There are some other uh, rivers that we've got in North Queensland which can be diverted. So there's the Herbert River, the Inersley River, we've got the Lind River. You can see how big they are. They run, you know, uh, water in there regularly. They've just had a flood in these rivers um, and the flood waters went over many of the bridges that are 10 and 15 metres above the height of the river. So uh, they get when they get water, they get a lot in them and then they just flood for the next two or three weeks. And then that's what's left, uh, you know, a month later. It's just the water holes in the, in the rivers. There's no big storages. This is the Gilbert River where they're doing some uh, irrigation. And you can see there's no big storages. They've just got one there on farm storage. Uh, and so that's being developed, but they haven't got a big plan to, to bring a lot of water. And the, the soil there is fantastic. The Flinders and Saxby Rivers, that's just showing you the, how uh, wide they are. And they had a lot of water in them. Julia Creek, not as big, but that still uh, has a big catchment. The Dutton River, you can see how big that is. There's a lot of water runs down that. And the Flinders River, well that, you can see it's probably what, about five, four or five k's wide. And that was a metre of water uh, above all of that area. And some places two, three and five metres deep. And that's another potential site for a dam as well. So these are the possibilities that we've got. And Winton, you can even get the water uh, down from the north into to Winton, no problems at all gravitationally. So that's about 450 k's down just uh, from the aqueduct system. So there's three stages of water infrastructure uh, that we need to look at to make any system a winner, winner and they have to be efficient. One is the catchment and storing of the flood waters, that has to be efficient, so it's got to be gravitational. We've got to be able to deliver the water to the farms and to the industries, that has to be efficient as well. We can use things like pipes uh, to gravity feed water because the aqueducts are above the ground. We can supply farms without much pumping of water, most of it gravitational. And of course, we can have a structure of uh, cooperative market for the products and exports so that uh, the producers themselves are in control of it and revolutionise the way that we sell our produce. We don't just take the lowest price and uh, we want to be able to be leaders in price as well as leaders in quality and quantity of foods and other things that we grow. Thank you.